Good morning, High Point. My name is Daniel Hunter. I am a member of the preaching team here at High Point, and I'm excited to see you all here. I'm excited that you chose to come and celebrate your Palm Sunday uh, here or online. Um, I uh, noticed the, the petting zoo outside. I tried to snag a, a pony ride a little earlier. I think I'm a little too big, um, but it is awesome that we get to have that, and, and if you have a a family and kids, I can't encourage you enough to stop by and enjoy the petting zoo um, and just celebrate in the, in the wonder that is today. So, Lent is almost over. We're here. We made it. Palm Sunday, Holy Week, leading us to Good Friday and Easter next Sunday. All that means that, that we are in our final week of our Wanderings and Wandering series. As we've looked at the Israelites wandering in the desert, and, and today, however, we move on into Palm Sunday and we fix our eyes to Easter, we're going to be looking at Psalm 118. As we've seen, the Israelites have struggled keeping the faith. They, they've struggled to, to remain obedient, listening to God throughout their journey. But even in the midst of all of that, God's promises we're still true and are still true. He's faithful even if we aren't, and we can count on Him being the same today and tomorrow and forever. You see, as I think about this, Psalm 118 is one of the most beautiful and encouraging passages of, passages of Scripture that I think is in the Bible. And, and, and on a morning like today, we, with what we deal with and what, with the news we've received I think it's an amazing work of God to remind us of all of this. Because it's a constant reminder of not just what God does for us, but who God is. You see, so, some background on the passage. We think that it was written by King David, like most of the Psalms, and it was sung at the founding of the second temple according to Ezra. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests and their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord, according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. Fun fact that's also known as Luther's psalm, as, as he had to say this about it. This is my own beloved psalm. Although the entire Psalter and all of Holy Scripture are dear to me as my only comfort and source of life, I fell in love with this psalm especially. Therefore, I, I call it my own when emperors and kings, the wise and the learned, and even saints could not aid me. This psalm proved a friend and helped me out of many great troubles. As a result, it is dearer to me than all the wealth, honor, and power of the Pope, the Turk, and the Emperor. I would be most unwilling to trade this psalm for all of it. So with that glowing recommendation, I just want to jump in. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to open up to Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can, what can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. You see, growing up, anytime I got a present, uh, a gift or money or anything like that, my mom always made me write a thank you note. And it led 
So I'm going to be honest, a lot of fights in the house. Not because I was ungrateful, but because I hated writing those thank you notes. Gratefulness as a kid definitely wasn't a strong suit for me. Because not only did I have to write the thank you note, my mom would always make me write like why I was thankful. Like if it was a gift, I had to write what I was going to do with the gift. Or if it was money, what I wanted to buy with the gift. And I just was not a fan because it ended up being like a paragraph. And as a kid, you don't really want to write. And sadly to this day, I think those memories are why I struggle with thank you cards. I'm much better at expressing gratitude than I was then, but still, thank you cards. My mom did something to me, I think. Um, But that's for another day. But really what she was doing was she was instilling in me as a kid uh, gratitude. Gratitude for something that someone did for me that I couldn't do for myself. Blessing me with something, helping me, giving me something. So even if I'm not great at thank you cards today, I like to think I'm a lot better at making sure those around me and people that bless me know that I'm grateful and thankful for them and what they do for me. How often, though, do we spend time in thankfulness and gratitude for the things that He has done for us? Or like me as a kid, do we take some of those things for granted? Or maybe sometimes life hurts and and there's not anything for us to visibly see to be thankful for. And so we just forget to be thankful for who he is, not what he's done. That's why this psalm begins with not just a call, but an emphatic call to thank God for his grace and mercy in everything. No matter the circumstance of our life, we should always lead with thankfulness. Gratitude for God, not only what He's done, but because of who He is. His love endures forever is used 34 times in the Psalms. As a reminder to them, no matter what, His mercy isn't temporary. It doesn't exist in just a moment. It's not fleeting It endures all things. As Charles Spurgeon says, the word endureth has been properly supplied by the translators, but yet somewhat restricts the sense, which will be better seen if we read it, for his mercy is forever. That mercy had no beginning and shall never know an end. So how do we have confidence in that? How do we stand and believe in that in the moments when it's most difficult? Well, as we see, as the psalm continues, as David continues to write in verses 5 and 9, it's a testimony to what God has already done in his life. He says, in my distress, I called on the Lord. God has always been there for him. When he called on him, God always replied. You see, when we continually call upon God, no matter the situation, He will show up. But we have to be willing to call on Him. You see, another fun fact about Psalm 118, it is the last of the six Egyptian Hallel Psalms. These Psalms were sung during the Passover celebration So during the the Last Supper, in the upper room as they celebrated, Jesus, knowing full well what was to come for him in the coming hours and in the coming day, is singing these words. He is praising and giving thanks to God, knowing what is coming. What is about to happen, he can still say, his love endures forever. So as we continue through this psalm, I want you to begin to look at it through that lens. Through Christ's eyes as he worships the night before he is to be put to death. 
Think about it. As he says in verse 9, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man or in princes. Now think about that in the context of today. Today we celebrate Jesus riding into Jerusalem with crowds shouting, Hosanna, declaring him king. In a week, they're going to be shouting, crucify him. They're going to choose Barabbas over him. Their praise and their worship is fleeting. And as he rides into Jerusalem, he knows that. His eyes still fixed to the cross and what is to come. And still choosing to worship. Because his foundation is in God. Where is your foundation? Where's, where is your security? Is it in, in status? Is it in your job? Is it in money? In relationships? All of those things are temporary. And I think as we see now, sadly, they're more temporary than you and I would ever like to think. So even in those moments, our trust should always be in the one thing that is eternal, and that is Him. That's why He says in, in, in uh, part of the psalm, what can man do to me? Paul says something similar in Romans 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He's writing these words to those that are worried about pain and suffering that was to come. And he's speaking to the promise of future glory. The promise of God. What can man do when our hope is in heaven? It is that spirit that led Christ to the cross. To give his life on our behalf. As we'll see this this Friday, at our Good Friday service, he goes from trial to trial, and each one there is no fear. There is no de de desire to defend himself. He knew what was coming, but the pain was temporary, and the glory of heaven is forever. And we see this as we continue in the psalm. All nations surrounded me in the name of the Lord. I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Again, Think about these words being sung by Jesus mere hours before he would be in fact surrounded by his enemies. Mocking him. Cursing him. Spitting on him. Saying the words but not focusing on the enemies. Not focusing on the hate or on the pain. But on God. On God's goodness. On God's plan. As I was thinking about this passage for the last few weeks, I'm not going to lie, it's been a struggle for me, and that might kind of sound weird with how uplifting and encouraging this passage of Scripture is. But I haven't been in a place in my life, to be quite honest with you all this morning, where I've wanted to really be encouraged or uplifted. For three months... My dad has been in the hospital, and about a month ago, due to pneumonia, we almost lost him. 
I remember it was a Wednesday night, and I got a text from my mom <clears throat> that he wasn't doing well, and it was getting pretty bad. So I rushed down to uh, the hospital where he was staying at about 10.30 at night, and I just remember tears in my eyes the entire way. As, as soon as I get there, uh, they're putting him on a ventilator. And I can't tell you the words they said because I don't remember them. I just remember seeing him in the weakest state I'd ever seen him in, having a machine breathe for him. And it looked like we just had a couple hours left. I remember driving home that night, and the whole time I, I just cried, just asking God for one more conversation with my father. Just one more. And over the course of, of the period of time since then, I, I would spend a lot of time, I would go every day, and he was unconscious for probably two or three weeks. And as it stands now, he, he had been moved to an ICU, and he's, he's, he's progressed, and he, he's been moved off of the ventilator, but he's not out of the woods yet. But I have gotten my conversation with him. But however, even with all of that, it has worn on me uh, psychologically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Anger gripped my heart lots of times because you see my dad over the last nine years has, has been through a lot and if I'm being honest it gets to me a lot so God and I go back and forth quite a bit on, on what's going on and, and why he continually puts my dad through all of this so as I was looking at this idea the passage the idea of goodness and love were quite hard for me because I was upset I was mad. But then I started to think about this idea of enemies. You see, we often think about the external enemies that surround us. But often the most dangerous are the ones that come from within. Our doubt, our fear, our anger, our selfishness, our pride. They can surround us and they can choke us off from the thing that gives us life. They can choke us off from God. So what are your enemies? What are the things that are trying to get in your way from your relationship with God? You see, Jesus rode into Jerusalem praised as a king, knowing those people would become the enemies that would call for his death. Yet he still had joy. He still had strength and he still had thankfulness in his heart. Where does that come from? Where does that joy and strength come from in the midst of our darkest moments? When I'm at the, the breaking point uh, uh, after the fear of, of maybe potentially losing my father, where do I find the strength in that moment to praise him? Our strength doesn't come from us. Our strength in those moments comes from Him. As it says in verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my song. Jesus even promises us in Matthew, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, one of my least favorite sayings has to be, God will never give you more than you can handle. I'm sorry, that is a bold-faced lie. Because if that was true, then why would we ever need Him? Sometimes we're going to go through periods of life where it is honestly just too much for us, trust me, I'm in one of them. It's in those moments that God gets to be God. 
We hand it to him, and he will be the one that sees us through, that the only explanation that we made it was him. Because his love endures forever. You will be exalted. You will be delivered from your present circumstance. You will be delivered from your hurt, from your pain, because that is the promise of God. As Christ endured the cross and was exalted to sit on the right hand of God, you and I too will be exalted as well as long as we endure in the name of Christ. That is the source of our joy. That is why we sing and praise His name. It doesn't mean you're always going to be happy because there's a big difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is a response to present pleasant circumstances. Joy is the knowledge and belief that regardless of your present circumstances, that you have a God that loves you, died for you, and because of that you get to live in eternity with Him. We have joy because in the midst of pain of our circumstances, we know it's temporary. Death has lost its sting because he is on the other side. And it's because of that reality we can sing the next part of this psalm with full belief. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you. I thank you that you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Again, read these words to the eyes of Christ in the upper room. Jesus proclaiming his entrance into the reality of heaven the forerunner on our behalf. Now we too can enter through those gates because of Him, because of that sacrifice on the cross. Christ, our salvation. Then we come to one of the, the most used reference scriptures, the, the scripture that Jesus continually points back to. The cornerstone rejected by builders but is now our foundation. Interestingly enough, in light of that rejection, the psalmist calls it marvelous in our eyes. Speaking on behalf of those that are redeemed, those whose life and future is built upon the chief cornerstone. They, we should rejoice in God's work. Christ's exaltation after the cross despite that rejection. Only God could do that. Not the religious leaders. They rejected Him. Not the Roman leaders. They crucified Him. Not the multitudes. They chose another. Not the disciples. They cowered in fear. Not the devoted woman. They were beset by grief. Only God Himself could lift Jesus high. When our hope and future is built on Christ, we can do nothing but marvel and praise His name because again, regardless of circumstances, God can't be beaten. His promises will hold true and we need look no further than the cross. Look no further than to this day that we celebrate. Jesus actually quotes this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And interestingly enough, he references this passage in response to the praise he receives during the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. You see, he enters into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, then he he curses the fig tree, he cleanses the temple, and has his authority challenged, and then in response gives us the parable of the tenants. I'm just going to run through that. It goes a little bit like this. There's a master that plants a vineyard and surrounds it with a fence, and he builds a tower in the middle. He leases that vineyard to tenants, 
And then every year during the, the fruit harvest, the master would send servants to collect the fruit. And the tenants, however, they beat one, they killed one, and they stoned the last. So the master sends his son thinking they have to respect him. Instead, they said, let's just kill him and take his inheritance. So Jesus asks them what the master will do. And and they all say, well, obviously, he's going to kill the tenants. Jesus responds, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to people people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be given to a people producing it. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. So the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, as we know at Palm Sunday, is actually prophetically connected to Psalm 118. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. That is Palm Sunday. All of this woven together beautifully by a creator to just show us again that he is in control. Let's check this out again as we close out Psalm 118. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has made his light to shine shine upon us. Bind this festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. In verse 19, we have the imagery of the gates of righteousness, much like the gates that you would enter in when you're coming into a city. Now in verse 25, we begin with the phrase, save us, we pray, which in Hebrew, guess what it translates to? Hosanna. And then in Matthew, as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, what do they sing? What do they shout? And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Come on, that's got to give you some chills, some goosebumps, something. God is beautiful, weaving together his masterpiece. As we read Psalm 118, it points us to today. From Christ to the Last Supper to to the references by Christ to this. God's goodness is on full display at an all-time high during Palm Sunday. That is true even in light of what is to come the rest of this week. It's true in light of whatever you you or I may be going through. It pieces itself together perfectly next week at the celebration of Christ's resurrection. Because just after this in verse 27, what does the psalmist refer to? The binding up, the sacrifice on the altar. Again, one more time, think about Jesus saying that in the upper room, knowing full well that the very next day, he too would be bound to a very different altar. All this church... All this is why we rejoice. This is why we should live lives of thankfulness and gratitude to our Savior. Because as he entered the gates of Jerusalem and the crowd shouted to praise him, only to turn on him, Jesus knew what lay ahead, and yet he rejoiced still. As the psalm ends, it just reiterates that same thankfulness, not for pleasant circumstances or for what he has done, but thankfulness and praise for who He is. For He is good. So this Palm Sunday church, you may be surrounded by enemies. That could be others. That could be your own doubts. That could be pain, hurt, and brokenness. 
Things may seem overwhelming and, and too much for you right now. And maybe they are and emotionally hit your break point and, and all you want to do is lay down and cry. That's okay. Lay down and cry. Let Him carry it for you. No matter what may be happening, you can have joy because of what we celebrate and who we celebrate. This Palm Sunday, let us reflect on Christ as our example, knowing full well what lay ahead for Him, still worship and thank God for everything, remaining faithful and giving His life for all, even those who rejected Him. Choose joy this Palm Sunday. Choose Christ. He can and will heal your heart because He is good and His love endures forever. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we may come to You this morning broken, lonely, lost, without answers, not knowing what lies ahead for us. But all of those realities that exist around us, one thing remains the same. One thing remains true. And that is that You are good. Your mercies are new every day and Your love endures forever. As, as we look ahead and as we fix our eyes on You and as we fix our eyes on the cross, may that always be a reminder for us of, of who You are. Even when everything around us looks like there's no hope, we know that we have hope because of who you are. And so, I, I pray this morning that we just hand it to you. That we worship. Not because everything is perfect in our lives, but because you were perfect. Because you were good. And because we can know that your promises are true. It's your name we pray. Amen.